Okay, welcome everybody to our SAFE webinar, which is a long-standing series, but this one will be a rather um, untypical one. Usually we talk about um, monetary policy, financial market issues, regulation, so pretty mundane stuff. Uh, this time we will get serious. We talk about religion and philosophy. The reason for that is that we have the great privilege and, and honor uh, to have Professor Benjamin Friedman presenting us his very well received book on religious roots of capitalism. It was published last year and got um, just ravish, outstanding in endorsements for a very good and very simple reason. Professor Friedman, by the way, also taught somehow part of this book at Goethe University in Frankfurt about three or four years ago in the PhD program. Uh, this is now, however, not a book for PhD students, it's a book for a large audience. And it is interesting because it merges um, economics and uh, religious and philo philosophical issues in a very interesting way. Uh, what Professor Friedman does is he contextualizes economic thinking against the background of uh, social, uh, religious discussions. This is, um, pardon the pun, it, that's almost um, heretical because uh, at least modern economics is perceiving itself or conveying itself as completely detached from anything about normative issues, it's pure. What Professor Friedman, however, does, starting with the notion of Weltbild, which he, well, German word Weltbild, which he uh, uh, takes from Albert Einstein, that there's barely anything which can be uh, thought of in terms of theory, which is completely detached. Uh, so this is in, for sociologists, uh, maybe not that thought-provoking. In Germany, we had in sociology two debates about Werturteilstreit, and one of them actually was in, insisting on that societal context, the second one. Anyhow, it is a, it, it's a very rewarding book. Um, and in terms of structure of our webinar today, after the presentation of uh, Professor Friedman, we will have uh, two eminent discussions. Uh, we will have Lisa Herzog uh, of Groningen University, but I guess she spent also some time at, at Frankfurt, at least there we ran into each other years ago. Um, she's a social philosopher uh, of great renown and has written a book, which I found particularly interesting on Adam Smith and Hegel in 2015. I learned a lot from it. Uh, and she has uh, uh, received many prizes. The second discussion will be uh, Harald Hagemann, Harald Hagemann, uh, formerly University of uh, Hohenheim, who is renowned for much of his uh, outstanding work in, on, uh, in German, we call it Dogmengeschichte, theory or uh, uh, theory of economic thought. Harald, you have to correct me. Uh, theory of, uh, of economic thought, but he always uh, puts uh, lots of math into his work. And still, even, uh, even beyond that bio biographical context, I, I read with great pleasure his work on uh, Leontief just recently in order to, to, to pretend that I've been prepared for this meeting. Um, let me, uh, one word on myself. My name is hans Helmut Kotz. I'm affiliated with SAFE um, almost longer than SAFE exists. And I'm also a resident fellow here at the Center for European Studies at, at Harvard. Um, since I'm, I'm not really, I'm, I'm, I'm too partial to the work of Ben. He instructed me over a long period of time and I actually audited his uh, lecture in 2010. Uh, we have these dispassionate, have invited these dispassionate discussions. Without further ado, Ben, may I hand it over to you? <laughs> 
Thank you, Hans Helmut, and thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this distinguished gathering. I'm very grateful, and I'm grateful as well to Harold and to Lisa for taking time to offer their remarks on what I've written, and I very much look forward to their comments. I would summarize the book that I've written in three parts. First and most important, the focus of the book is to address the question of where economics, by which I mean modern Western economics, came from and why it arose when and where it did. Now, to be quite specific, what I have in mind when I think of modern Western economics is the discipline built around the core insight that we often label the first fundamental welfare theorem. And that is the idea that individuals acting merely on their own self-interest with no altruism involved can, and under the right circumstance of competitive market conditions, will end up making other people better off as well, in addition to themselves. You know, we economists take this as for granted these days, but if you pause and think about it, this is a very fundamental insight, which doesn't necessarily emerge naturally from uh, simply contemplating the world. Now, the usual presumption is that uh, economics as we know it is a part of the Enlightenment, uh, in particular, the Scottish Enlightenment through Adam Smith, David Hume, and other key figures of that era, and I very much accept uh, that presumption. The presumption that I do not accept, and which I uh, am at pains to rebut in the book, is that because economics is a child of the Enlightenment, it therefore had nothing to do with religious thinking. The usual presumption is that the Enlightenment represented a movement away from thinking in terms of a God-centered universe toward what we in our modern vocabulary would call secular humanism. And that's the part of the usual framework that I reject. To the contrary, I argue that uh, Adam Smith and his contemporaries were powerfully influenced by what were then new and highly contentious and indeed hotly contended strains of thought within the English-speaking Protestant world in which they lived. And in particular, I point away, I point to the movement away from predestinarian Calvinism. The key point in Calvinism uh, is, which I elaborate at some length in the book, uh, is a very, uh, I would say, a very pessimistic view of the human character. Calvin's phrase was total depravity, very pessimistic view of people's chances for uh, effecting their own salvation in the afterlife. Uh, the key phrase there is predestination, under which a person's either being saved or not saved is determined not only before that person is born, but before the world is created so that there's nothing the person can do about it. And also uh, the uh, Calvinist idea is that humans exist in the first place for the glorification of God rather than for any purpose of being happy. Now, right at the time that Smith and Hume were coming into adulthood and forming their views of the world. Hans Helmut pointed to my book's reliance on this idea of Einstein's, the image of the world, the view of the world, however one tra translates uh, Bild der Welt. Uh, right at the time Smith and Hume were forming their views of the world, uh, this movement away from predestinarian Calvinism toward a quite different religious view of the world was coming into play in uh, Scotland. It has, this, had, this had happened earlier uh, in the latter part of the 17th century in England. Uh, it was happening in Scotland right at the middle of the 18th century when they were coming to young adulthood. And in my own country, it was happening in the latter half of the 18th century, which not coincidentally, uh, 
is when the American Republic was created, but that is a different story. I argue that's not a coincidence, but that's not a different story. Now, I don't say that uh, Smith and Hume were religiously uh, committed individuals. That would be just false. Uh, we know, uh, and these people were international celebrities in their own lifetimes. We know a great deal biographically about them. And it's very clear that neither Smith nor Hume had any uh, religious uh, commitment to speak of. But to repeat, they lived in this world in which these new religious ideas were all around them. And importantly, the time and place in which they lived was one in which religion was more important, more central, more per pervasive, more multidimensional. Religion affected everybody's lives in many ways that we don't have today. It all goes far beyond anything we know in modern Western society. And so I do not uh, try to claim that this uh, new religious thinking was the only influence on Smith and his contemporaries. Uh, I point to the uh, influence of Newton. Uh, Isaac Newton's great book, The Principia Mathematica, was published in 1687. By the time Smith was an undergraduate at Glasgow, uh, the book was part of the standard curriculum, not only at the Scottish universities, but also at Cambridge. Interestingly, not at Oxford, and maybe that's why Oxford lagged behind in scientific pursuits for so many years. But these people were all trained Newtonians. They were trained to think in terms of system and mechanism. And that was great. Uh, that was Smith's uh, great contribution, I believe. It's not that people before didn't have the insight that individuals acting on their own initiative could make others better off. They did. There were people like Mandeville, Canet, um, uh, Bois Gilbert, importantly, but I argue that none of these people had uh, any explanation the, of a genuine kind for how this came about. None of them understood the importance of the competitive market mechanism, and that's what Smith did famously in The Wealth of Nations, and indeed when you read the book and go back to those passages on how the price system works, uh, it's just striking what Newtonian language he uses to describe this process. He could be describing, if you just look at the language, he could be describing uh, what makes the planets circle around the sun, but he's not. He's talking about what allows the price system to guide the allocation of economic activity. So uh, I argue that yes, of course, the Newtonian influence was important. Yes, of course, uh, his, uh, uh, his training in, in Stoic philosophy and the precepts of uh, natural harmony, the idea that if you do something that makes me better off. Well, of course, this exhibits some natural harmony in the world and Smith had all that as well. But I claim that what is missing in the standard account is the, uh, this turn away from predestinarian Calvinism, which created a new, uh, more benign, more optimistic understanding of the human character, what humans acting on their own were capable of doing and achieving, uh, a new, more uh, expansive view of the possibilities for human agency, what humans, what can happen when humans simply act uh, on their own device, and also the purpose of our being here so that if the purpose of the world is human happiness, then it's not surprising that the world, including human institutions like markets, are structured, uh, structured so that uh, humans are better off. So that's the core uh, argument in the first half of the book. And then in the second half of the book, I move on to trace the influence on economics of this uh, religious thinking uh, from after the death of Smith in 1790 down to the present. Now, to be clear, uh, I do not claim that especially in the 19th century, uh, the American economists are the most important economists. That would be false. Uh, there were people like uh, Malthus, uh, Mill, uh, 
um, Ricardo, uh, Jevons, they're, they're, the, the British economists were dominant during this period. Uh, but nonetheless, I'm an American. I'm interested in how all this played out in my country. And of course, by the time we get to the 20th century, uh, increasingly Americans start to uh, dominate the field. And so uh, as a teleological matter, I wanted to see how all of this led to uh, where we are uh, with American uh, economics today. And here again, I argue that the role of religious thinking uh, simply pervades the uh, early development of, economy, of economics. In the 19th century, all of these debates over free trade versus protectionism, for example, in the first half of the 19th century, in the late 19th century, we had a particularly interesting debate uh, in the United States in which the debate within the religious community over two views of the role of the Protestant churches, one that we call the social gospel, and the other that we call the gospel of wealth, uh, this debate within the Protestant church establishment reflected itself in a debate over the role of government or not in addressing what was now understood to be widening economic inequality, even in a world of economic growth. Not surprisingly, uh, this is of renewed interest today because that's exactly, at least in the United States, uh, what we have. And on into the 20th century, uh, I think it's fair to uh, view Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal in the 1930s as the embodiment of social gospel thinking. Uh, in the, the economic sphere and the coming of Keynes to America. Uh, and then uh, at the middle of the 20th century, a very important development, uh, the effects of which are still with us in my country today. And that is the coming together of economic conservatism and political conservatism under the catalyst of the threat of world communism. Then the third and final aspect of the book that I would uh, mention uh, is the uh, particular role of religion through economics in American politics today. Uh, one of the great puzzles of American politics that our listeners may have encountered is the tendency of so many Americans to vote in ways that run counter to their economic interest. I have in mind, for example, uh, citizens in states like Mississippi and Kentucky that overwhelmingly vote for uh, candidates who would like to shrink or even eliminate programs like food stamps and public housing and supplemental income support, uh, programs that residents of these states draw on to a much greater extent than residents of states elsewhere in the country, yet they vote against uh, these programs consistently. Now, our political science colleagues have uh, an explanation for this, and I argue for the, in the book that the political science explanation is not wrong, but seriously incomplete, because it has no explanation for the fact that American evangelicals uh, members of evangelical Protestant denominations, not only uh, vote overwhelmingly for conservative Republican uh, candidates, but also independently of elections, express views on economics and on economic policies that are different from other, from other Americans. Evangelicals think about the economy differently than other Americans. They think about the role of government in the economy differently from other Americans. And I argue that this just can't be an accident. We can't ignore that. And any attempt to explain these voting, these people's voting behavior in a way that simply sets aside and ignores the overwhelming body of survey evidence that we have that their views are genuinely different has to be seriously incomplete. And so the last part of the uh, book, shortest by far, uh, addresses this puzzle of American uh, politics today.
So the, I, uh, Hans Helmut, I'll finish there. I think that's a summary, a fair summary of what I did in the book. And I very much look forward to Lisa's and to Harold's uh, comments. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, it occurred to me that I made a major mistake. I didn't really properly introduce yourself. In a second, I should add that you are the William Joseph Meyer Professor of Political Eco Economy and former chairman of the Department of Economics at Harvard University. I will never do that again, Ben. Sorry for that. No. That is correct, I am. <laughs> um, Harald, uh, did it ever occur to you that religion would have an impact on economics? Uh, yes. Uh, since it should I, be a little bit longer on that. Yeah. <laughs> since I have dealt with the subject more in seminars than writing myself on it, but reading Max Weber and the modern debate on the connection uh, between economics, some insights from modern endogenous growth theory, and how religion contributed as a main factor or was a main barrier to economic development in the long run. And um, one reason is uh, that I always was interested in historical developments, not only in the history of economic thought, as you were mentioning at the beginning, but also uh, on politics. Uh, uh, and uh, I think this mix, uh, which also characterizes Ben's book between pure economics, but also or economic development on the one economic thought on the one side, and uh, how it is engraved or integrated in the uh, in time and space, uh, how uh, certain historical, political uh, developments are affecting also economic thought and economic development was always the subject which interested me, although I did not myself write a lot on this. Now, in his introduction of his fascinating book on religion and the rise of capitalism, Ben Friedman refers to Max Weber's classic work on the Protestant ethics and uh, the spirit of capitalism, in which Weber claims that Protestantism was historically a spur to forms of personal behavior that gave rise to modern capitalism. But Ben also says explicitly uh, that his book, which shares some strands of the controversy on the powerful influence of religion in substance is more nearly Weber upside down in the sense that it is focusing more on thinking about economics than on economic behavior. And Ben argues in particular that the creators of modern economics, which he mentioned in his talk, also David Hume and particularly Adam Smith, whom I would say is a great hero in Ben's book, uh, lived a century later than the time on which Max Weber focuses, when belief in Calvinist predestination was in retreat among English speaking Protestants. And I would quote Ben here, where he says that the beneficial consequences of individually motivated initiatives carried out in competitive markets was the expanded vision of the benign human character and its possibilities that the movement away from predestinatarian Calvinism fostered. And here you have a contrast in Calvin, Calvin's is much more deterministic and highly pessimistic in his view of human nature and this contrast with the principal position of the Scottish Enlightenment, Ferguson, Hume, and Adam Smith in particular. So there's a greater trust in human nature and the outcome of individual decisions in the Scottish Enlightenment. Uh, just one side remark, on page 372, Ben also refers to Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels and the quotes Karl Marx with the famous statement that religion is the opium of the people. Now, Friedrich Engels, who himself was the son of a very successful Protestant uh, textile industrialist, which gave him also 
the money to support Marx in his life and uh, his writing activities. Uh, Friedrich Engels in 1844 made the explicit statement that Adam Smith was the economic Luther. I think this is a quotation which uh, Ben may like and which would fit to the regression line of his argument. Now, uh, in the reviews so far, I saw on Ben's book, uh, there's one review by Ellen Wolf. And let me quote uh, a passage from this review because I would like to comment it then now. Uh, Wolf says, for one thing, this book, which she highly appreciates, is mistitled. Its overwhelming concentration is on only one religion, the Protestant one. You will not find a discussion here of the two great papal encyclicals, Rerum Novarum and Quadragesimo Anno, that form the basic of Catholic social teaching. By confining himself mostly to the Protestant countries of England, Scotland, and Holland, Friedman, for all his range, narrows his focus too much. Now, uh, I would like to comment it. It's also narrowed within the Protestant <laughs> regions or countries. Coming myself uh, from the uh, liberal Protestant city in the Hanseatic north of Germany, one has to say that uh, Calvinism uh, is much more much more rigid, much more rigid than uh, other more liberal areas of Protestantism. And uh, for, uh, so uh, if you take the Hanseatic cities in Northern Europe at the Baltic Sea, the Northern Sea, who were trading a lot with other countries in the past, uh, with the exception of some parts of the Netherlands, they were much more open and more influenced by Lutheran uh, ideas than by the more rigid Calvinist one, which came a generation after Luther, you may say. Now, when Max Weber famous to, uh, published his famous essay, the most elaborated critique came from Luyo Brentano, who besides Schmoller was a leading uh, representative of the younger historical school, and he was the most Anglophile one and more open-minded uh, to trade unions, for example. But he came out of a very literate family, originally uh, coming from the Italian North, a Catholic family. And in reaction to Weber, he pointed out in his book on the beginnings of modern capitalism, which was published in 1916, where he emphasized that there were Catholic cities and regions, in particular in Northern Italy, cities like Venice or Florence, or in Flanders, where you had very successful cities, economically successful in Antwerp, Wood, and Ghent as important counter example. Now, uh, this was historically quite interesting. Uh, and uh, if you look, at uh, modern economic developments, uh, there were some publications uh, which were influenced by modern endogenous growth theory. I particularly want to refer to Ludger Westman, who is professor at the University of Munich and uh, very much working and focusing on schooling and these is is education and these issues. And alone and with various co-authors, he uh, was reflecting uh, Max Weber's thesis. And there's a famous paper, by the way, published in the Harvard-based Quarterly Journal of Economics in 2009. Was Max Weber wrong? A human capital theory of Protestant economic history, in which the central argument is that Protestantism, not uh, Lutheran or Calvinist one, uh, wanted that people could study the Bible. And Luther, for example, had translated the Bible into German, which was only existing in Latin and ancient Greek before, so that the ordinary person had the chance to read it. But that was the time when the great majority of the population, 90% plus, were illiterate. And uh, this religious influence to study the Bible 
was a great incentive uh, for literacy. And this was referred to as the central argument for the economic success of the more Protestant area. And they made some empirical investigations. And one main result was that the difference between Protestant and Catholic areas disappears when the economic effects of schooling and education would be eliminated. And this has a certain modern importance. If you look at uh, China, you may even ask the question whether Confucianism is even topping Max Weber's Protestant ethics. So with regard to China, religion, and the great uh, economic growth process in China uh, might play a role. Let me make uh, two more comments. Uh, one uh, is that uh, Ben in his book also focuses on the work of uh, early institutionalists like Richard Ely, who was one of the co-founders of the American Economic Association, and John Bates Clark, who both had studied for some time in Germany and were very much influenced by the German historical school, which had also a strong ethical focus. And I think this was important. The Verein für Sozialpolitik, the German-speaking economic association, was founded as a kind of reaction to the economic evils the social problem existing in the middle and the end of the 19th century, which no open-minded person could overlook. So uh, their social reformism of leading institutionalists and co-founders of the American Economic Association was also influenced by the ethical approach of the German historical school. Let me make one final comment. Uh, ben, also in his uh, talk, repeatedly referred to Albert Einstein's category of the worldview. And in the book always comes Schumpeter together with Einstein. Schumpeter with his vision as a pre-analytic categorical act. Let me add here that Robert Heilbronner, who studied with Schumpeter in the late 1930s at Harvard, wrote a book which was a million bestseller on the worldly philosophers, which interestingly starts with Adam Smith and ends with Keynes in between, uh, ends with Schumpeter and Keynes in between those marks. So uh, exactly the categories worldview by Einstein or vision by Schumpeter are more or less dealt with by Robert Heilbronner in this book. Now, Thomas Kuhn in the structure of scientific revolutions as Ben points out, uh, emphasizes the importance of non-intellectual aspects of culture, specifically the role of institutional and socioeconomic factors in scientific developments. And coming back to Schumpeter, there's a lot of discussion in the last 20 years on the so-called lost seventh chapter uh, in his theory of economic development, which originally came out in 1911, and when the second and revised edition, which was also the basis for the English edition, which was published by Harvard University Press in 34, uh, it had seven chapters and not six. And the seventh chapter had the title, The Overall View of the Economy, in which Schumpeter also integrates economics with social, historical, political questions and institutional ones, which of course, includes religion as an important factor. And in the foreword to his revised edition, where he eliminates the seventh chapter, he says, oh, this is a fragment of sociology, which only would distract the reader from pure economics. But sometimes pure economics can be poor economics. And one area where this is the case is development economics. If you talk on the problems of underdeveloped countries, you have to understand the historical, political, religious regions for underdevelopment. And the Washington consensus would not be enough to overcome underdevelopment in these countries. And I think Ben's work on religion and the rise of capitalism is a very good example where differences in religion and their economic and social consequences have to be considered also in their historical context. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Harald. It was fascinating. Again, showing you know too much. Uh, I hand over to uh, uh, to Lisa. Uh, pure economics is poor economics. I've stolen that from Harald. Uh, reading your work, and in particular reading your 2014 work, uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe I didn't read it carefully enough, but I didn't find anything about religion. So how does that relate to your work? Yeah, thank you, and thank you for having me here. Uh, my book was asking different questions, but I agree very much with the reading of Adam Smith um, in, in Ben's book. Um, I think from the sources, it's actually also quite plausible that Ben, uh, sorry, not Ben, Smith was actually an, a deist. Um, he refers very often in his works to the deity, the creator, and, and I I've always found this irritating that this side of his thought was not taken up in a critical way by later thinkers, because it means that we smuggle theological assumptions into the further history of economic thought. Um, and I found the account of Adam Smith and his time in the book extremely convincing. Um, also the focus on the, the confluence of Stoicism and Newtonianism and certain versions of Protestantism. I think that that's spot on from what I've read on Smith and discovered in Smith. Um, the question is, what do we do with this? I mean, I agree with the basic premise that all social science starts from certain cultural presuppositions. But in the way in which economics works, um, it's, these are very often hidden in modeling assumptions. So, so I studied economics myself, so I'm hopefully allowed to say this. We learned all these models, um, but these broader cultural economic background assumptions were never really made an issue. And if you come from a different field, like philosophy in my case, and you want to do interdisciplinary work together with um, economists or drawing on economic writings, that's actually a constant frustration that the implicit premises are not made very explicit. Um, and the philosophy of science has been very clear in recent years um, about the role of values in science, even in natural science, but all the more in the social sciences. I can very much recommend the work by um, Heather Douglas on the role of values in science, and also the need for scientists to take responsibility for how they do science and how they teach it, how they communicate about it for broader societal questions, which of course raises all kinds of questions for economics and for how economics is also being taught. But I, I would want to qualify this general issue of the relation between religion and capitalism. And I, I had the same thought as this reviewer that it's really Protestantism and capitalism here, not, not other religions. Um, that it's actually an empirical question to what extent relig religious content plays a role at different points in time for economic thinking at the level of doctrine or at the level of these broader worldviews, belt builder, whatever you call it. And I found it absolutely fascinating to read about how Ben traces the development of these different forms of Protestantism in the US over time and how different religious attitudes lead to different understandings of human agency, human progress, et cetera. What I would have been very interested in knowing more about, but of course the book is already very long, is the way in which these religious views trickle down into popular culture. The book is very much at the level of, of, of doctrine, looking at uh, theological treatises and so on. Um, but of course, um, often the way in which these doctrines become psychologically and thereby socially influential is then in social practices and communities. So the social, so sociological dimension of religion also in the different um, immigrant communities and how that related to the doctrines. That's something that I found myself wondering about when, when reading the, the accounts. Today, I guess, if one asks to what extent is religion an influence on economic behavior, I'd say there are really differences between the countries. I mean, there's no equivalent in Europe to millennial evangelicalism in, in the US. There are maybe some fringe groups, but they are politically not at all powerful. 
And that that is really um, very interesting in the sense that um, I think it also influences the way in which um, the market is taken for granted as an institution in the US or in Europe. My sense has been that throughout the history of economic thought in, in Europe, there has always been a greater awareness that the market is one possible mechanism of social coordination and social integration, but there are many others. And I think there's also a greater sense of human beings being always already embedded in various communities. Whereas in the US, you have a greater sense of individuals being masters of their own fate, um, arriving in a new country, breaking out of the European communities, the feudalism, the guild rules, all these things. And, and, and there are some very interesting studies looking at the way in which social ties are or aren't presupposed in individual agency, how that differs between the US and, and Europe. Um, if you want two pictures to imagine this, just take the open prairie of the of the West versus some medieval Italian city or so, and you get the different ways in which social embeddedness um, plays a role for people's uh, imaginaries. And I guess for me, the central problem or the, cent the cent central challenge today from a systematic perspective is really this assumption of self-regulation in markets that is so deeply anchored both in economic thinking and in this wider worldview. Um, and the conditions of the possibility of markets actually self-regulating in this way are often completely overshadowed. Um, and what is taught, especially in undergrad education, are a few models and what they convey is, in a way, this belt built, this image of the, the, the market much more than the really sophisticated theories that economists have also developed. Just to, to give one example, um, the uh, general equilibrium model that is taught so often assu assumes full information and does, doesn't thematize the way in which information is actually handled in markets. We have all the research on the economics of information, information asymmetries, um, markets for lemons, all these things, but those are not integrated in undergrad teaching. And so in that sense, a very simplistic picture gets conveyed to the masses of people who only ever get a, a sort of short introduction in, into economic thinking at an undergrad level. So I think that's something where the book by drawing attention to the religious background of these early economic models um, also raises questions about how we actually teach economics um, because the models don't help to unlock all these interesting backgrounds, but they also then don't allow people to challenge these assumptions and to ask, well, to what extent do people still hold these views? Can, can we make sense of these assumptions today? Um, and so in that sense, I wish that, that all economic students got a sense of these broader cultural and religious backgrounds from the very beginning when, when they uh, start studying economics before having to learn all the models. Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, ben, may I ask you to respond? Because you started off with the first theorem of welfare economics and Lisa has now been criticizing that you insist on that. May I get you going? Yes, I'd be happy to. And for, let me again thank both Harold and Lisa for their very insightful and thoughtful uh, comments. And there's much in what you said that I'm not going to be able to respond to. I'll pick out just a few highlights. Uh, the place where I should start is uh, with uh, Harold's uh, quoting from uh, Alan Wolf's uh, remarks. Uh, that the, in my book, what I focus on is uh, Protestantism, and in particular, the Protestantism of the English-speaking world. And perhaps I should have made uh, clearer uh, in the book, uh, but let me clarify now. Uh, I did not set out to write a book on the general uh, influence of religions, plural, on uh, economic thinking. That's not what I was doing. Uh, I'm an economist. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an intellectual historian. I suppose I was uh, 
uh, masquerading as an intellectual historian in this book, but I'm, that's not what I do. I'm an economist. And what I was trying to do was understand where economics, by which I mean our economics, came from. And uh, it, it will not surprise you that I know something about um, the you know, Roman Catholic thinking and the scholastics and all that. It will not surprise you that I know something about the Hebrew Bible and the Talmud, I do, but uh, Smith, and I, I, think, um, I, I think it was uh, either Lisa or Harold said that Smith is the great hero uh, in the book, and I think that's quite right, that's a fair reading. Uh, Smith uh, lived in 18th century Scotland. It was a Protestant society. There were some, uh, there were some Roman Catholics around, it is not obvious that uh, Smith knew uh, many Roman Catholics, uh, nor that he was influenced by them uh, in any way. Uh, I did some research. I, I worked very hard to try to find out whether Smith had ever met a Jew. Uh, is very hot, very. Uh, there's some suggestive evidence that he might. Uh, there were two Jews who were. Uh, studying in Edinburgh at the time he was teaching in Glasgow. That's as close as I was able to come. Uh, Hume uh, was quite friendly with a Jew named Isaac de Pinto, and they had a correspondence that's published. Um, there's no evidence that Smith ever met a uh, Muslim. There's no evidence that Smith ever met uh, a Confucian. So um, if I were writing a book on how religious thinking broadly construed has influenced thinking about economics. I, of course, would have talked about the Talmud. I would have talked about the scholastics. Um, I know a little about uh, you know, Muslim views. Uh, I could have gone off and learned something about uh, Confucianism. There's a, there's a marvelous book on uh, um, Japan and this in Japan uh, by we were chatting earlier about Talcott Parsons, another of Talcott Parsons' students was the sociologist Robert Bella, who under Parsons wrote his PhD thesis uh, on the role of religion on uh, capitalist development in Japan. The book is called uh, Tokugawa uh, Religion. But that's not what I was doing. What I was interested in is where I started at the other end, you see. I started at the end of where did our economics come from? And that led me back to Smith. And once I had, uh, Smith and his contemporaries, and once I had uh, gotten there, then what mattered was the religious thinking swirling around them. And the fact that uh, in the year 400, the people who were writing the Talmud had interesting ideas with economic implications uh, didn't uh, didn't enter. And I think this is my answer also to Harold's uh, quite right point that even within Protestantism, I'm looking at Calvin and then the English speaking world's movement away from Calvin. I understand that there were uh, Luther uh, had uh, ideas uh, about these things too, very important. And to a certain extent, Calvin took them over, like the um, religious value of secular work by the laity. That's a Calvin idea, but he got it from, he got that from Luther. That was a Luther idea. So that mattered. But if it wasn't filtered through there, it didn't matter. The last thing I will uh, say about, um, uh, uh, well, to say two, two more things about Harold's comments. One, I very much agree with you, Harold, about the importance of literacy. And beyond literacy, I would point to the importance of the technology, the printing press. Uh, and the question which I often throw out for my students is, why is it that we associate the Protestant Reformation with Luther and not with Jan Hus? There's an overwhelming answer that I get from my students, and you know what it is. The answer that I get from my students is, who in the world was Jan Hus? And that in itself is informative. Why is it that we know who Luther was? And except for a few people don't know who Jan Hus was. The answer is that Luther lived after the printing press and he was enormously uh, 
uh, productive and uh, wrote all these pamphlets and the pamphlets were whisked off to the press. And even though Harold, you're right that uh, literacy was limited in those days, a typical Luther pamphlet within days would have 20 to 30,000 copies in, uh, in print and very influential. And poor Hus uh, lived a half a century before the printing press. Finally, I'm glad you mentioned Bob Hallibrenner's uh, book. Uh, what Heilbrenner was doing was telling for the public what he saw as the highlights of Schumpeter's course on the history of economic thought, which he, uh, he Heilbrenner, had taken as a graduate student in my department at Harvard. And of course, the book, the, the course, was later published as the book, History of Economic Analysis, which although the title page doesn't show it, uh, the, the book was written but not by Schumpeter, but by his wife. Uh, Schumpeter, Schumpeter died in 1950, and Elizabeth uh, wrote the book, and it was published in 1954. So um, if we were doing things the way we do it today, at the very least, there would be two names on the title page. It would be uh, Joseph and Elizabeth uh, Schumpeter. Uh, but what Heilbrunner was doing was, th this was Schumpeter's thinking and Bob was re retailing, not, eh, that's unfair retailing. Bob was translating for a broad audience what he got from Schumpeter's course. Now, incidentally, I agree with uh, Lisa uh, turning to her remarks, I very much agree with you. When, when you say Smith was a deist, I agree with that. And the way I put it in the book is that Smith was a deist of the form that we in America, uh, looking at figures of that er age, uh, that, that time, we identify with, say, Thomas Jefferson uh, or Benjamin Franklin. And um, at least in, in the American context, we do not think of these people uh, as religious uh, figures. Uh, Franklin is interesting. Um, Weber, being a sociologist, of course, worked in the in the uh, with the method of ideal types. And in the Protestant ethic book that Harold mentioned, who is the ideal type that Weber mentions? It's Benjamin Franklin, and he makes very clear that he picks Franklin precisely because he was not a uh, religious figure. Uh, Franklin uh, says in his autobiography, Franklin came from Boston, for goodness sake, with all of these churches around uh, from the Puritan tradition. And uh, Franklin writes in his autobiography that he went around all of the churches in Boston when he was growing up and he sampled all of them. And he didn't find any of them that, he, that appealed to him. And so that was that. Uh, so Franklin was very much a non, I, in our terms, a non-religious figure, but yes, Yes, uh, Lisa's right. Uh, he was uh, he was a deist. I think Lisa, you raise a very interesting question, which I am not equipped to answer, on how these religious views, uh, as you put it, trickled down to popular culture. That's a very interesting question, and the only observation I would make is that in many cases they didn't there was always a tension between the religious views of the intellectual elite. And you're quite right. That's what I'm writing about is that I'm writing about the thinking, not the actions, not the everyday behavior, not the buying and selling, but the thinking of people whom we whose names we would recognize as economists who, who had thoughts and wrote them down. By definition, this is the intellectual elite. And often, and it's true in the United States today, um, the religious ideas of the intellectual elites are different from those of the common uh, people. Uh, in Smith's day, the great debate in Scotland was between the moderates, that's Smith's group, and uh, what we now call the evangelicals, not their uh, word for them. They called themselves the, they called themselves the popular party. Why? Because they, they uh, embodied the view of ordinary people. Smith and his uh, colleagues in the, in the moderate party, the moderates were the anti-predestinarians. 
they uh, were the intellectual elite. And I think you see it today. The evangelicals uh, whom I write about in the latter part of the book today are not either the uh, economic or the intellectual elite of the United States. Evangelicals are marked by much lower incomes than other Americans, and they're marked typically by not uh, having um, university educations. And if they have university educations, it's typically not at universities, uh, at universities like mine. And the final aspect of uh, your very insightful comments that I'll uh, refer to, Lisa, is your notion of uh, uh, the idea of these religious influences on uh, economic behavior. Harold is right. My, my book is not about it, religious influences on economic behavior. It's about economic thinking. But Lisa, you're quite right. There are these religious influences on economic behavior, and they're still here today. Ask why, for example, uh, Americans uh, work roughly a month a year more than our friends in, uh, in Europe. The typical European works about 1,500 hours a year, and the typical American works more like 17 100 uh, hours a year. Where does that come from? I think any, and this is your point, Lisa, I think any attempt to explain that behavioral difference without adverting to the um, uh, Puritan Calvinist um, uh, origins of the United States, I think isn't going to, uh, isn't going to get very far. So uh, there's lots more I could say, but I know, Hans Helmut, that we want to leave uh, time for uh, audience participation. So let me simply once again thank both Lisa and Harold for your very thoughtful, very insightful comments. And perhaps we can follow up uh, later on. But Hans Helmut, back to you. Thank you very much, Ben. I'd like to have a little bit of a re reaction from our two discussions. And then we have 40, 50 minutes for Q&A or slightly less. The first is, uh, Harald, you spoke of Flucho uh, von Quentano and his reference to the Italian cities. Do we need Ben's perspective on capitalism in Italy as a different version of capitalism than the one he is talking about? Yes, of course. <laughs> it was uh, also concerning time a little bit earlier. But uh, if you think of the creation of modern banking system, for example, in, uh, you still have many Italian expressions <laughs> in, uh, in finance, like Giro or others. So, uh, of course, that was a different form of capitalism at that time. But it was, okay, there were, it was... Uh, Developed, developed and elaborated before Luther and Calvin. So, uh, mm -hmm. but still, when there was one main Catholic church dominating greater parts of Europe, mm, perhaps I may allow to make three sh very short comments to what. Uh, one minute. Yeah, well, one minute. Ben just said uh, the first point concerning uh, working time. There are exceptions in Europe. If you look at Switzerland, they are closer to the United States, but this might be due to the Calvinist tradition you have in Switzerland. <laughs> they have still had more 45 hours working week. Second, your Cal Cal Calvin and Zwingli. Yeah, yeah. And second, you were referring to John Hus uh, and Bohemia. And unfortunately, Hus was murdered uh, just less than 200 kilometers less. Uh, south of my place, uh, but when you look at the former uh, communist system in Central and Eastern Europe, then Bohemia, where the influence of Hus and Czech Protestantism was the greatest, had by far the highest productivity within the communist world. And when uh, the Soviet system collapsed in uh, the early 1990s, the Czech Republic was Bohemia, which was the industrial center of the Danube monarchy, had the highest productivity levels and is still doing quite well. And sir, you're completely right with regard to technology. And there you have a much better 
linked to Adam Smith and the Scottish Enlightenment. Smith wrote on the eve of the Industrial Revolution and in his dealing with division of labor and technical progress, he was very far sighted. Lisa, um, what I liked in particular about your remarks was that you said agency is important and then you stressed um, there are other mechanisms of uh, regulating uh, beyond markets. So that's the, the notion of there's varieties of capitalism. Um, and uh, here in Europe, we have many of them. How would you link that to our events book to our European context? See, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to convince Ben to write about Europe also. <laughs> that is an interesting question. And um, given time constraints, I, I just want to make two points here. So, so one is, I mean, when one speaks about agency, one can think about how does religion either enable or hinder a human sense of agency? But there is another question here, and that's probably how a sociologist of religion would look at that question. And I would want to add this perspective, not saying that one is right and the other wrong, but I think it's important to keep that as mind. in mind. Don't people also, to some extent, choose their religious views based on their economic and political situation. So a sociologist of religion might say the reason why evangelicalism is so powerful in the US is because if you are one, among the working poor of the US today, your life is so hopeless and the likelihood that you'll work your way up in the way Smith imagined is that's so unlikely. So you better believe that Jesus comes back soon because that's the only way to get a bit of hope into your life. So there's a chicken and egg question here about where the preference for certain religion comes from and what that then does to humans agency. I think one other dimension of this is the relation between individual and collective agency. Um, and, and that relates to what I said about different mechanisms of social integration. Um, today, very, very many issues in our societies like climate change, inequality, I mean, all, all of the big problems basically, require collective agent and not only individual agency. And markets emphasize individual agency a lot. And this deeply ingrained cultural individualism is becoming more and more of a problem for our societies, I think. I mean, for some people, if you join a union, you're on the first step towards the gulag because there's a slippery slope. Um, the road to serfdom, as, as Hayek called it. And so, I think the, the question of individual versus collective agency and how religious views facilitate one or the other or push people more into one or the other direction, that is a very interesting dimension of the problem. And Adam Smith wrote at a time when unions were not yet a social reality, of course. Um, and he also saw in his day workers actually having the upper hand vis-a-vis -vis employers. That's not the situation we have the situation we have today. Today, the only sort of big collective economic agent that is left is, is big corporations, whereas all other collective agents have been attacked by this or undermined by this individualism and um, or deregulated or whatever. And, and that creates a huge imbalance of power that is a, is a huge problem for our societies. So much more could be said, but I'll Stop here, but just this relation between what I can do as an individual and where I should work together with others, uh, not in competition, but in cooperation, that seems to be a very important dimension of this deep cultural and religious influence of, of economic thinking. Very well argued. Maybe Smith was with theory of moral sentiments somehow on, it, on that way. And Harold, you invited to correct me. Uh, I guess John Stuart Mill also saw good reasons for collective action and, and for units. Now I try to bring in the audience. So I'll, the first question is by Abdul Kadir Gulsen. Can getting rich be the only aim of human beings? Could you please elaborate on problems such as increased loneliness, selfishness, and so forth? Ben. Easy question to you. Um, well, I don't have a lot to say on the subject of, of loneliness, but 
I don't know anyone, uh, nor any economist, who would have thought that getting rich is the only uh, objective of human beings. Um, there's not a lot on the subject in uh, what I wrote, except to uh, that I, I did uh, devote uh, quite a bit of space to Smith in the book. Again, uh, whoever said that Smith is the great hero of the book is right. And Smith uh, certainly has an enormous amount to say about the role of uh, material uh, wealth and material living standards and living the good life. Uh, look, this is a person who wrote an entire book called, the, as you just pointed out, Hans Helmut, The Theory of Moral uh, Sentiments. Smith was not an economist. There was no such word there. He was a professor of moral philosophy. So it never would have crossed Smith's mind to think that um, the sole, uh, the sole uh, desideratum in life is uh, material wealth. And indeed, in uh, both books, he's very scathing, contemptuous, dismissive of the consumption decisions made by rich people with what they choose to do with their uh, their wealth. So I think this is not an idea one should associate uh, with Smith or with economics in general, for that matter. The, uh, the, the question of George Perendia refers to uh, your point that some in the US seemingly are just voting against their interest. This in Kansas not anymore, Ben. Well, he's right to point to uh, the what's the matter of he's, he's referring to a book uh, by a journalist, not an economist, but an insight or, an, or a political scientist, a journalist uh, from uh, the United States called Thomas Frank. And the, the Frank book is very good. I uh, refer to it in my, uh, in my uh, own book. Uh, it is of the political science form, however, uh, in that it does not take on board any religious uh, differences between the evangelicals and other Americans. And so uh, I absolutely read, uh, recommend to people the, the Thomas Frank book. The title is What's the Matter with Kansas? Uh, incidentally, the title is itself quoting from a famous newspaper article written in something like 19... 1909, 1910. He didn't come up with the title on its own on his own. Uh, but the, the the book is all about this puzzle of why um, why people in Mississippi and Kentucky vote for people who want to cut back food stamps. And it's not that his I wouldn't say that Frank's explanation, which is the standard political science explanation, is wrong. I just say it's seriously incomplete, and my evidence for saying that it's incomplete is that it, uh, it, it makes no attempt to explain why evangelicals, uh, as opposed to other Americans, have these distinct views on economics and the economy and the role of government. But the Hans book is very good. Sorry, Ben. Hans no, Jörg Nau uh, uh, Nauma is asking, uh, what's the role of Methodism and its founder, John Wesley, who was deeply influenced by the Bo uh, Bohemian brothers, the Herrenhuter? Mm. Uh, yes, uh, Met Wesley is an influential person in this story, not so much for Smith, but for the American uh, part of my uh, story. Uh, Wesley and Smith were contemporaries, and I tried to find out whether there was evidence that uh, Smith owned any of Wesley's writings, not clear that he did. Um, but importantly for this purpose, Wesley was a strong, strong, outspoken anti-predestinarian. He dismissed the uh, theory, uh, Calvinist idea of predestination in really striking uh, terms. He called it blasphemy. Uh, he called it a horrible uh, doctrine. And so to the extent that my main hypothesis about where uh, modern Western economics comes from hinges in part on, in important part, uh, 
on this move away from predestinarian Calvinism, Wesley is absolutely a key part of that with his uh, opposition to uh, predestination theory. And Wesley, even though Wesley uh, appeared in the United States only very briefly in the 1730s, he tried to open a mission in Georgia and it was not successful. He went back home to the UK, but Methodism became very important in the United States, especially in the 19th century. And today, uh, Methodism is the second largest Protestant denomination in the United States after the Southern Baptists. So very, very important. Um, in comes our friend Jan Kran. Jan is asking, you mentioned the role of Protestant church and the role of government in the economy. Could you comment on the same issues in Europe? Oh, well, no, I, uh, I, I don't like to th uh, think of myself as going around commenting on other people's countries. Come on, Ben. But um, uh, we, the, I see the two as very different because religious, uh, write any sentence with religious as an adjective and then a noun afterward, and then talk about uh, Europe versus the United States. It's a very, fill in the, fill in the blank with any noun you like. Uh, America is very different in terms of religious belief, religious participation, religious commitment, uh, church going, uh, whatever. Uh, it's a very different world here than what you have in uh, Europe. And that's not to say uh, one is better and uh, one is not. Uh, but our world of uh, the churches is, is and, and, when, and today, incidentally, because, because of our, another difference, importantly, uh, is that because of uh, our commitment to immigration, uh, which until very recently you have not had, um, when I say the churches, I mean also the synagogues, the mosques, the Hindu temples, just on and on and on, because our religious landscape is uh, diverse in a way that yours is not. Uh, the role of the churches here is much more important than anything you have in Europe. I, I found in particular interesting uh, your chapter 12 on economics for social improvement. And what I wasn't aware of that at the beginning of American economics, Uh, this was very much oriented. You cite uh, John Bates Clark and Richard T. Eli towards improving the fate of, of, of the population. But I'd like to have our two discussants come in for the last minute. Lisa. I mean, just to continue the discussion of the differences, one point that does get discussed in the book that I find very interesting is this idea that religious communities have certain responsibilities such as taking care of childcare or education and so on. But it's really very different in, in, in Europe. I mean, France is the other extreme where we have completely sec secularized schools and just Wednesday afternoon, kids are free to go to religious communities for religious education. Germany is a bit in the middle. Um, but that I think is a very important element for explaining the very different attitudes towards the welfare state, um, that it's okay to receive support from religious communities. And this is also where a lot of private philanthropy that happens. I mean, not, not big philanthropy so much, but more sort of middle-level uh, redistribution. But this perception that this is not the state's business, um, I find that really interesting because that there's no equivalent to that really in, in, in the European countries that I, I know about. So that would be another element of the question um, uh, by, by, by the last um, participant. Harald, there's now here, of course, this 3.5 billion built back better with a quite a, quite a social dimension. Okay, so let Harald. me just mention one point. Ben in his book has also sometimes the expression uh, in Latin, cuius regio eius religio, which is referring to the fact that in many regions, not only in Germany, 
since the middle of the 16th century, the whole population had to take the religion of the ruler, the king, the duke, or whatever. And here I want to refer to Prussia as an important counterexample, uh, where they, in their enlightened self-interest, were much more tolerant on religious issues. And if you ask the question, why the hell could such a backward rural area like Prussia with a low population ever become a European superpower? And uh, one of the main reasons is the fact that they were tolerant on religious issues, even with some exceptional cases, the ruler was a Catholic, but mainly Protestant. And they benefited a lot from the influx of uh, uh, people who were uh, forced out of other countries, like the Huguenots after the revision of the Edict of Nantes in 1685 in France. And the Huguenots brought with them the most advanced manufacturing technologies. And this, was, this tolerance on religious issues was in the very enlightened self-interest of Prussia, for example. Also, some Dutch who came uh, when there were wars uh, uh, between different Protestant groups also in the Netherlands who emigrated to Germany, Prussia, Oranienburg, for example, Oranje in the north of Berlin is such a city, or the Dutch Quarter in Potsdam. Vielen Dank, Harald. It was great to have had you, Ben. Uh, enormously in inspiring. Um, and I would encourage any of our participants here to take a look at this really uh, more than interesting book, earning all the uh, all the raving uh, endorsements it, it's got. Again, many thanks to Harald, Lisa, and vielen Dank, Ben. <laughs>